wanted to stop. Yeah. I, I, I've got a question for everybody. Mike, uh, all of the American guys, has hockey and all sports in the States become a rich man's game? Well, uh, um, rich person, Wally. Rich person's yeah. game. Thank you. Well, I think we're, yeah, there, it's, it's being created to a place where, like, if you walk into any rink that I'm in on the East Coast, I mean, it's it's basically uh, BMWs and Mercedes Benz and Range Rovers. I mean, it's uh, but it's it's made that way. It, 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 a lot of it in a lot of our sports is because, like, the associations allow this to happen. Our governing bodies, you know, actually promote it, right? So it's it takes away the recreational aspect for kids, and when they when they see a little bit of talent. We're so fast to put them in to a uh, quote unquote travel environment, elite, you know, environment, which, again, seems to work like you got to remember, I'm in the world of, uh, you know, mid Fairfield here. So I'm in the world of, um, you know, Trevor Zegeris and uh, Spencer Knight and, you know, all these kids down here and all the Long Island kids like McAvoy and and, uh, you know, even even kids like Sonny Milano and things like that, that, you know, these kids don't do anything else. Uh, they play hockey and they play on 15 different teams year round and that's how they developed. So it, it, I think a lot of people go down that path that, you know, like to Tom's point, you know, the kids don't get the freedom because the parents are so, they're so scared not to try to keep up with everyone else. But the fact is, if you really wanted to succeed, you wouldn't keep up with everyone else. You'd, your kid would go do the other things that everybody else is not doing. You know, all that time that you spent in a car, you know, Connor Bedard's at home putting in thousands of more hours in stick handling that that I would assume is free, <laughs> you know, for him. His mom said he, she didn't really like it when he did it in the living room and broke some vases and stuff. But... <laughs> yeah, and then you have all the parents down here that wish their kids would do that. Like, how do I teach my kid to do that? I said, you can't teach your kid to do that. That's mm -hmm. just who they are. You know, you can't build, we've talked about this before, right? You can't, you can't create, you can't, it's so hard to build passion into kids, you know, if, unless you put them in, in an environment to, to be passionate, but it's really easy to take it out of them. That talent code by Daniel Coyle, he talks about that being the separator in all music, Anything. ever. just the people that put the time in on their own. They go above everybody else. Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah. I mean, Hockey's can be crazy expensive. Um, my grandson also plays lacrosse, and it's just the, the the cost to play lacrosse is just a drop in the bucket. Um, same with soccer. What do you need? A pair of shoes um, and the association fees. Uh, the 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 ice, the cost for the ice is really what makes hockey uh, so expensive. Well, it's a factor, a big a big factor that would separate it from say basketball or soccer. Or, or lacrosse, um, and uh, yeah, it can it can be it can be really expensive and definitely turns people off. Um, here in the states, the and Mike Mike can talk to this better than I can. Uh, the NHL supports uh, play hockey for free um, to get you know new hockey players on the ice, gives them all their equipment. Um, that's been a really good way to get people involved in the game at a young age for the most part with very minimal cost um so peter uh, peter yeah i just want to to mike's point there about when you when he was asked mike when you were asked about parents how how do i make my child passionate about hockey or it goes I, I shouldn't be trying to make you passionate about hockey. I should be raising you to be a passionate human being. I should raise you to have a good work ethic, be excited about the things that you do and you enjoy. Then if you like hockey, you become passionate because the kids probably don't even know what that means because they're not taking the trash out. They're not making their bed. They're not picking their socks up. They're not doing anything that's responsible or doing basic things that grow you as a person. Uh, so how am I going to be passionate about anything if I don't value things, if I don't have a value system created for me? So create a passionate human being 
And then if they like whatever it is, sports, music, whatever it might be, then they'll likely find something to be passionate about. But if you don't teach them what that means as a human, how are they going to just, you're not going to flip a switch. You're just going to create robots. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, just uh, to get back to the to the cost question, you know, like I think we do a really good job here on the beginner programs. You know, like we do a, a learn to play, for example, it's like 10 weeks. It's um, 100 bucks or something like that, right? Then go for once a week. Okay, so that's great, right, for the learn to skate, learn to play. But then what comes after that, right? So at our association as a nonprofit, the, the tuition for the travel program starts at pretty close to 2,000 bucks. That's And that's a nonprofit that's... That's where that's the starting point, right? For playing youth hockey around here, um, we do have a development program. So um, it's it's kind of designed for you know kids that are are really young to start into it. So it starts from like age four, but we kind of let we let kids into it up to anywhere up to age 12, 13. Um, you know, basically anybody who wants to start playing hockey is welcome in that program. And then we kind of divide it up by size and ability and stuff. It's all in house. Uh, they go three times a week. And we we purposely kept the cost as cheap as we possibly could. It's like six hundred bucks, I think, and they get ninety ice times if they go to everything, right? It's 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 a really big value program. Um, and over the last like three four years, that's where all of our four or five six year olds have started, and now and seven year olds. Now this year, you know, we had a we actually had a lot of parents that really like there was a big demand for putting together a travel six U team. So you know, as soon as you do that. Right. And they're not doing they're not they're literally not playing the, the competition within our own in-house league is as good, if not better. Because, again, like we have the ability to break up like the the really little guys with like the medium sized guys and the bigger guys. And the bigger group is is like probably pretty close to like a low end 10 U travel league. You know what I mean? So like these six U's, if they came out to that, they'd be getting better hockey than what they're getting in the six U league. By putting them in a league, it automatically more than doubled the cost. It's like it went from like 600 bucks to like 1400 bucks. And, you know, I went down to a game the other day and they had bought third jerseys for the team. You know what I mean? So not only are you buying now two jerseys, but now they had a third jersey that's like a camel color or something like that. And it's like all these extra things that just don't add value. And But people desire them, right? Parents desire them. So as a program, you know, like we kind of said, OK, sure, you guys, if there's demand for it, sure, we'll put a team in this year. And we really kind of stuck to our guns not doing it. But there was a lot of demand this year and, and they filled up. We had like, I don't know, 25 kids or something like that sign up and, you know, created a whole new age level. No, we're still seeing with that development program, like it's, we're still seeing growth with that. But even though and it actually kind of freed up some room in that for, for more kids to join it. Right. By taking out those 25 kids that played U6. But it's it's interesting, like. We say people love spending money. People love spending money. Yeah, last week, Sammy Jo Small was on, and she's talking about her pro team and the fact they have a, a, a one million five hundred thousand dollar budget for female salaries, and she's also coaching her daughters in U8 hockey or. U6 with her husband, Billy Bridges, who's a sledge hockey star. And she is perplexed because they have done exactly what you said in the Toronto area. They uh, had parents complain that the hockey wasn't good enough and they've created an, uh, three elite teams and they've taken four or five players from her team and where they would have had an amazing experience playing for both of them, coaching them. And that's the reality. The people aren't satisfied. Their kids at six are that much better and it's not good enough for them. And I don't know what the solution is to hold them back. Um, I'm not sure if it's good or bad. It might be good in terms of the, the Bedards, uh, you know, to me, you have to be upper middle class minimally to play the game at a, a highly competitive level. At some point, 
you've got to invest time and energy. It, I, I don't know. Back in our day, we didn't have to do that. Hockey was still a seasonal sport. So it's Mike uh, Bonelli. He mentioned that he worked with the Rangers and they've created these free programs, free equipment, but they haven't gotten the results in terms of people continuing to participate in the game. And that's sort of like in inner city New York. So I'm just not sure how these uh, affordable advantages can pay off in the long run because uh, I'm I'm just looking at Tom's team and they're going to create one more elite team and they're going to be traveling next year and the costs are going to go up quite a bit. But I think they're affordable for the people we're talking about. But boy, everybody is putting in all the extra time with the hopes of, you know, becoming the best they can be and maybe getting a scholarship. But the the driver for us in Canada is usually the NHL and the pro career and the the fame of that achievement. But boy, college education is sort of a big goal for most families. Tim Taylor. Yeah, Wally, well, I just did a quick search here. I looked up the registration fee for one of the local AAA teams. Um, so our local club teams, Tier 2, um, the registration fees are somewhere just under $3,000. I think they're around $2,800 uh, to, to join the club. And then, like Al was saying, then you have things like, you know, buy the third jersey and, and some of those things. But the team's you know, always have fundraisers to cover those kinds of uh, incidental costs. Um, and the, the club teams travel to a few tournaments. Um, our, our local team, our local club tries to do like, you know, a couple uh, day trip tournaments and then maybe end the season, take a big trip like the Lake Placid or so, something, something like that. Um, so it's, it's for, you know, uh, uh, a middle-class family with two, two incomes. It's, you know, if they love hockey, that's that's that could, that that fits in a budget. Um, but to go play AAA here, then the the fees are approaching eight thousand, and I've seen higher higher than that. Uh, but those those guys do a lot more traveling. Um, the the AAA teams here in the Philadelphia region will make several trips to New England um, to to play, and they're, they're just like weekend games. Um, and then they do they do more you know they'll play tournaments out in Chicago and Arizona so the additional cost at the AAA level that's that's when you start talking about like really significant um, in, investments you know, that's a, just to give you a little glimpse of how how it is here in our area um, in Philadelphia and I imagine it's not that much different for you Al yeah it's um it's definitely in that direction i'd almost separate that that elite or club hockey into two segments right there's so i i also coach a team in that world also and uh like here in mass there's like the main divisions there's like three or four divi well first off there's two elite leagues like completely separate within each of those there's four like three or four divisions right so what is elite if you're playing on one of the bottom teams in either one of those quote unquote elite divisions, you're probably playing on like my town, league, my town association's third or fourth team. But you're elite. And you're paying double. Right. Like we got kids. Like I saw a kid last night walking around with a new bag, new socks and stuff like that. He plays in like the third team. But he's now he's he's on an elite team. And that's that's that association's the top elite team. You know what I mean? So th there's that. But then within those those club leagues, like there are, there's an elite division, and that's, you know, the mid Fairfield teams. I think play mainly in that top division that Mike was talking about. Um, you know, the kids that are playing on the top teams in that, like the Junior Eagles and stuff, like that's a whole other ball of wax. Like those kids are, they're traveling to, they're traveling to the brick, they're going to the queue, they're going to, they're taking flights to go play in four, five, six tournaments 
during the season plus the summer like it's unbelievable the amount of money that these that those types of players and parents and families are investing like it's insane i don't know how anybody has that kind of money to be honest with you but like you know again like we're missing out especially you know especially in the spring and the summer we're missing out on so many free or low cost skill building stuff like around here even even like a ball hockey league right like i put my kid in the ball hockey league last year because all his buddies wanted to play in the spring so they they had this local rec one night a week ball hockey thing and it was like 60 bucks for seven or eight weeks perfect right but now you know then then they said oh well we, now we have the travel team so now everybody's instead of a t-shirt everybody's got like a head toe uniform everybody's got the jacket they're going on five or six tournaments where they're driving as far as buffalo to play friggin ball hockey instead of putting a net out at the side of the street. You know what I mean? And they call themselves the USA ball hockey team for 12 year olds. Like where, I don't know, it blows, it blows my mind, like how much people love spending money on things that make no sense. There's like a shooting guy around here. I went just to see what it was like. I just, I brought my son for like one day just to see. This guy's charging like 120 bucks for 50 minutes to shoot pucks. For like seven year olds. Right, like go to the basement and buy a bucket. You know what I mean? Like I took Joe, like I took Joe once and I was just I was blown away. So, you know, we spent like he spends so much time in the basement shooting pucks. It's like he's getting so much more out of that. Honestly, God, taking him to that shooting guy screwed him up for like three weeks because he tried to shoot tell my freaking little kid how to do a snapshot and he had no idea. You know what I mean? So I don't know. It's my take. Sorry if I'm a little bit frustrated on this topic. It's uh it, it blows my mind. Tom, you mentioned Bedard and his dad, and he did it all on his own. Yeah. Um, did he have a skill instructor, or was his dad the instructor? Well, uh, well, this this video here goes for you know videos that his dad took, and like I just got it on right now. Right now, he's stick handling in the hallway in his house. It it looks like he just did it on his own and his dad. You know, there, there's no part there that his dad's given instructions to him. Okay. Just little things, just like McDavid did. McDavid would put on his uh, rollerblades and make different kinds of circuits. You know, and he invented a new one all the time. And his dad said, uh, once a neighbor came over to him and said, look, it, you can't make your kid practice like this all the time. It's not fair. He's blah, blah, blah. His dad said, I don't do anything. He says, I can't stop him. He wants to do it so you know and that's he's got the fire and bedard it looks like the same exactly same thing because he he also looked for roller places to do things all summer too so it's a neat little video it's but it's on tsn it might is it on the, the do, do you have a link for that tom you might be able to share i'd like to see that uh, here, did you post it in the Facebook group, Tom? Well, I got it on my uh, Ice Hockey Coaching Youth to Pro. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll look, I'll look for it there. First, uh, there's only about three things on top of it. But it's it's really neat to watch. A kid is just out there practicing, and that's what he loves to do. Yeah. Any of you have any kids that are that passionate to do it on their own, the fire in their belly? Well, Danny used to kind of be like that. Danny Heatley, he yeah. practiced his shot all the time. You know, practice. Part of it here is Bedard broke his his hand, so he practiced all the time with one hand doing stuff. But, uh, I think all the really good guys, that's what they do. Hell, yeah, I've had. I've had a number of kids that were like that. Um, Blake Wheeler was one. Um, and that video, if it's going to be, it's up to me, which is on YouTube, which I shot. Uh, I don't know if he was a pro yet or not, but um, I could see it when he was a peewee and a bantam. And in high school, he, he did extra. We also had another kid in that group who, you know, would, would run. He was a football player too, and he set up, he set up cones in his front yard in the afternoons and he would he would run around these cones with his football 
And then he'd grab his rollerblades and skate around the neighborhood and then come back and shoot some pucks, take his rollerblades off, run around with his football a little more. He, you know, totally passionate athletes. Uh, and Joey ended up playing a little bit at the University of Minnesota, but, you know, Blake went on to the National High League. Um, I think youth sports is all about the parents. It has nothing to do with kids anymore. It's a family entertainment and ego trip for parents. If you think about the money that they're spending with the hope of getting a college scholarship, which on average is worth about a four-year scholarship's worth, a public institution's worth 70 or 80,000 bucks. They've invested way more time, money, uh, and effort to get something of a lesser value. The return on investment financially is terrible. But it's all about ego for the parent, not so much for the kid. And, you know, those of you that coach youth hockey, um, you know, Bantams is where real hockey kind of starts. Kids have to start making some decisions there. And I got, I mean, I've coached a lot of kids over the years in Bantams, and there's only one reason they're there. It's because their parents want them to play. I got one on my team right now. If he didn't have the parents he had, it, he'd, he'd quit in a heartbeat. And I've had kids tell me I'm only here because my dad makes me come. So I think this is all a society, ego, rich person sport. Um, and even, even in a place like Minnesota, where it's so cheap on a relative basis, um, you know, I just think it's, I just think it's disappointing, and I think we mentioned before that the, the you know play hockey for free. Ten thousand kids quit every year between squirts and peewees, and another ten thousand a year quit between peewees and bantams. And you know, I think the reason is the parents don't they don't see the return on the investment. And now think of this: we're only talking about one kid. I mean, I got a number of players on my team who are part of a six children family and they all play hockey, <laughs> you know, and they're all in private instruct. I mean, it's just, they're spending a hundred grand a year. And the kids aren't, you know, they're not, they're not passionate about the game. Parents are passionate, but the kids aren't. So I am uh, wish Peter was still on. He mentioned um, everybody we've mentioned here, everything we've mentioned here, uh, hell, it's about the purpose of the game. And we, we've lost sense of that. And uh, Peter identified that in terms of the human development factor of learning some, some life skills in terms of effort and enjoyment. And uh, I, I want to go to Rick because I think, Rick, you coached at what would be a competitive hockey level, the highest at that age group. And uh, I'm wondering if you have any comments related to that, because back in our era, in your era of coaching, I don't know that the parents pushed as much as they do today. The kids appeared to be want. They wanted to be there, but they could also play other sports. So I'm curious about, Rick, your impression of what we're talking about. Well, uh, quite frankly, Wally, I think I agree with most of what's been said. Uh, a lot of the participation, the majority of it is, is ego-based. Uh, as an example, uh, one of my boys also coaches. He's coached uh, AAA at uh, both male and female at the Pee Wee Bantam and Midget level. And uh, this year he went with one of the outlaw leagues to see what that was all about. And he's got a group of Pee Wees. And I asked him, I said, how many are legit AAA players in, in a regular minor hockey environment? And he says, maybe one, just one. And that's a maybe. But they are spending all kinds of money for... He just finished a three-day session uh, sleepover for the kids where he ran a three-day camp for them because that's what the parents wanted. They wanted to fund it. Um, these kids, in, in his experience so far this year, 
again, maybe one of them is there for his own purposes. The rest are there because mom and dad told him he had to be. Very difficult coaching situation, obviously, as we all, I'm sure, recognize. Um, so, yeah, I, I can't disagree with anything I'm hearing here. And while you made an earlier comment about Hockey Canada and how they've, they've gone fo totally focused on the elite stream of things and, uh, my, you know, the group as a whole is has not been abandoned, but it's been pushed way into the background where it's not a real focus on what they're doing and what their purpose is. It's very frustrating. I see way too much money being spent on individual skill training, as has been talked about here, uh, and no result coming forward from it for the kids. Or if he if he does benefit from it, it's detrimental to what he's supposed to be doing in the group concept. Uh, it puts him in his own mind above everybody else because he's been here, done that with whoever. So I, I find that part of it uh, over time has become uh, quite quite uh, detrimental to the the overall objective. Al, Al and Tim, I see your hands are up. Do you have a, any co comments to add? Yeah, I I have one on the on the ego. So I think I definitely think that that's part of it right there. I think there's there's definitely a segment where ego plays a big part. But I think uh, from what I see. A lot of it is not so much ego based, but FOMO, like the fear of missing out or fear of like there's like every like, oh, you got to do this. You got to do that if you want your kids to succeed. And everybody loves their kid. Everybody wants their kid to succeed. Right. So I think there's there's a lot there's an awful lot of that going on where and it's and it's partly our fault, like with the skills stuff. You know what I mean? If For the people that run the programs. Um, but at the same time, it's like the, all these well, you got to play spring league. You know, and you got to go and you got to be involved with this team or you got to go to this skating guy or you got to do this, you know, for your kid to develop. And, you know, there's a lot of people that don't. They, it's easy to get caught up in that for most people. Right. Almost everybody, like even I mean, it's it's really hard not to, you know, if, you, if you've got a kid that's in that or that's in that world. And especially like if all their friends are going to do it and we've kind of run into run up against that situation a little bit. You know what I mean? Like if all their friends are going to go do this. Now all of a sudden, oh, I want to do that too, or the kid wants to do that too. So it's not even just on the parents, although I think a lot of that, a lot of it's the parents that drive it, but also the kids, you know, for the kids that otherwise might be the ones that are out there shooting or whatever, like because their buddies are all playing on these spring teams or all going to these skills or whatever, that they want to do that too. But, um, you know, we've really tried to at least, because we're, I mean, I'm in it right now. I got a 10 year old, um, you know, and we've consciously like, I mean, he's playing on he is playing on two teams because I'm involved because of my involvements, honestly. Uh, and he wants to. He's got friends in both, so he wants to play with his friends. And that's really been our focus. If he wants to skip a night, like we pick our nights that we skip. We make sure he gets at least two two days off a week, which probably isn't enough for a ten year old, but whatever it is, it is what it is. We never do two in a night. Like we're not running from rank to rank. You know, there's lots of kids that are doing that, that are going from one rank to the next, you know, for a practice with this team, a practice with that team, and then a skills with another team, or one in the morning. Like and as young as like 2014s, which are what seven. There's people that are doing that, um, you know. And honestly, like we've skipped the power skate and stuff that's offered through his association to shoot bucks in the basement more times, like to play three posts, just the two of us, because he loves it and he won't go down. He doesn't. He's not. Well, I say he likes it, not loves it. Like he's not. He's not like the the Connor Bedards or the Crosbys that are going to go out and you can't stop them from doing it. But if I pick up a stick and I say, hey, you want to go shoot bucks? Play three posts then you get his eyes light up and he's like yeah i want to shoot three i want to hit three posts i'm gonna beat you dad like he loves it you know and it's a great time for us and it's like i feel like that's what it's really about right it's like the time that i've invested not even just my own time like bringing him to the rink but the time i've invested in the association and stuff it's all for like it's for that relationship between me and the kid because we only got him for you know a certain amount of years right and he likes doing it and that's a great time for us and you know if you look at it that way and like the friends that he's made like all of his best friends are on his hockey teams, you know, he's like, they're doing sleepovers like every other weekend and, you know, all this stuff, like it's great, but you've got to be really conscious about what you stay away from. If you're going to do that. I, I'm curious uh, about how all of us sort of ended up totally hockey. And we had to earn livings, and we did, but we still were immersed in hockey. And uh, even today, to be dedicated to the game and trying to 
help the game serve some better needs. Um, I'm really curious about your child, Al, everybody's kids, and what they get out of the sporting experience or what they get out of whatever experience they put their hearts and souls into. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier the word passion. Uh, we talked about Bedard's passion. And I think the kids have to sort of discover a passion. And uh, that's, you know, ours is sort of still hockey. But those kids, encouraging them to discover what they really like and what they really want to do and allowing them to do it, I think that's the art of parenting and uh, just letting them become the people they want to become doing good things. So that's a bit of a challenge, but uh, we're sort of locked up into the experience from a hockey uh, outlook. But I, uh, I think of my teaching career and coaching multiple sports and watching kids that were just as dedicated in drama and art and they went on to do great things in life and uh, myself I had two other daughters that in the end chose completely different avenues that they I'm just proud of what they are doing with whatever they do today Tim you've got a hand up I think, yeah. right, Jim, I think Hal, I think Hal was first. Uh, Hal, go ahead. Okay, Hal. I, mean, I think it's always nice that we take guys like your, your Canadian guy or we take Wheeler or we take Gretzky even and, and hold them up as role models because they were clearly driven human beings and they made it. But most of the kids that actually do have that kind of passion, my son was one, they didn't make it. You know, you're only going to make it so far with the, with the skills that you own. And I've got a kid that I coached for three years, and he's, he's down in junior hockey, and he is not going to make it to college hockey. And I've never had a kid work harder at his game and off ice than him. My son also learned how to, how to strength train. And he learned this for hockey. He's now 30 years old. He works out in the weight room on his own every single day uh, that he can. And, and so many benefits came from the journey, not the destination. And um, I, to, to me, that's what's really important. And I never pushed him to play hockey. You know, he he started playing hockey after I'd been coaching for 20 years before he came around. And um, Tim, <clears throat> yeah, I just uh, I your think mic, Al, Hal, you're my, muted. My Hal, your mic just turned off somehow. Oh, sorry. I guess my bigger point is that I agree with you all that it is about the journey and the things you learn about it, whether it's hockey or music or anything else. And but parents have to provide opportunity, but not. Um, you know, I read once that for the for, for hockey players, you got to have the right coaches and the right opportunities at the right time versus their stage of development. Um, and and don't push them beyond where they're supposed to be, and then they need a support system at home. There's a great story about Mikhail Schifrin, who is one of the world's best uh, competitive skiers, female skiers, and while all her class of skiers, when they were teenagers, were traveling around in what I would call the skiing equivalent of AAA hockey, uh, going to races all over North America and Europe, she was just skiing. And they lived and they moved to Colorado, and she just skied every freaking day. When she started to compete, world champion 
18 months and she's never looked back. But she put in the time and the energy and the effort on her own. And uh, so a lot, of, a lot of things we can learn from other sports too. So uh, guys, I got to go. I got actually a meeting I've got to go to. So again, I love love being this. I, I hate the days I can't come to do it. So goodbye. Bye Every bye. day is a great day for hockey. Yeah. <laughs> See you guys. Have a great weekend. Okay. Uh, fire away, Jim. Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, a few years ago. I I took the time to do a a, a mindset uh, development course, and it had a it was uh, a a hockey themed. And one of the assignments that that I had was to interview uh, one of one of the of my players. Um, and at this, at that point in time, I was uh, I was coaching uh, an eight uh, U team, and my grandson was on it. So I interviewed him. And what what brought this to my mind was, you know, while you were started to go down the road to say, you know, saying that, you know, we why did we choose hockey? And and uh, it's it's funny what what triggers some some kids. But what the question I had, one of the questions I asked is, what did he like about playing hockey? And his answer was he liked it when he was skating down the rink very fast and the air was cold and it would make his eyes water, um, which just was like, when you think about it, that's, yeah, that's what happens when you're skating in, in cold, when it's really cold. Um, it was just, uh, it, it took us all kind of by surprise that that was the answer. So um, sometimes you just got to ask the kids what they like. Um uh, or why they you know why do they like what it is they do? Um, but I I had never forgotten that it was just kind of an off the wall kind of an answer. Um, anyway, I, to, for me I think that's what makes hockey different is the skating. Um, there's just just something about the skating aspect of the sport that is unique and and uh, it's very. Al, uh, Hal just mentioned uh, downhill skiing. It's very similar to downhill skiing in that regard where you're just where you're gliding. At, at at some at some speed. Anyway, that's that's what came to my mind. <clears throat> Tim, I've got a question. Uh, you grew up playing multiple sports, and uh, could you could have chosen different sports, I believe, but you ended up choosing hockey. And I'm wondering about why did you start sports? How did you get involved? And at what point? Do you think you realize you, you could do this for a lifetime? Are you asking me or Tim Bothwell? Uh, Tim Bothwell. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I was a, a sports geek when I was growing up. And, uh, you know, my mom was, uh, uh, her, my grandmother was a, a great golfer. And my mom loved to play tennis. And so she was really interested in athletics and Kind of instilled that in us and i you know i was thinking as you're saying that i'm not sure exactly what it might have been that uh, you know drove the passion um in me for hockey i could play basketball in high school and was pretty good and maybe could have gone on to play at college i don't know uh but i don't know and you know i i, I guess the one comment i have is i i like to sort of touch on Hal's point about the journey because there there are because it's a very good point that you know his son was really passionate about hockey and trying to get better at it but he never made it but but that's okay um you know a lot of the great players that do make it are passionate and you know in some cases pathologically so um and maybe that's not healthy to encourage in your young kids to be so driven about one thing that if they don't make it or they fail at it, that it's going to damage them. It, it really does come back to encouraging the enjoyment of the activity, whether it's drama, music, hockey, tennis, soccer, basketball, baseball, whatever it is. It, what drives the passion is the enjoyment. And if the parents get focused on outcomes and results and you're better than this guy better than that guy or you're not 
then that kills or can kill the enjoyment. Like just celebrate the joy of competing and getting better and making improvements. That's what drives the passion, I really think, uh, more so than focusing on how many times you score or don't score or how many games you win or don't win. Um, the enjoyment drives the passion. That's a good point, Tim. I talking to uh, friends whose kids are playing competitive hockey. They're really not enjoying the experience, and all the discussion falls around not winning and not being as good as the other teams, and trying to get them to be better. And I think just that question of are you enjoying the experience and how can you make the experience better for them? That's the bottom line here. Um, Rick, you coach very competitive U18 hockey. How does that enjoyment factor fit into it for you, your players, and your parents? Sorry, my mouse quit on me here. Um, I'm not sure I can even answer that right now. Well, I haven't thought of that for a while, to be quite frank. Um, yeah, most of the competitive stuff that I, I coached, uh, it was on outcomes. Most of the focus was on outcomes, not so much on how each individual or how the group is developing. When in reality, when you develop those two factors, the outcomes improve to your advantage. I can't argue the point that at all that uh, the focus is on the outcomes and the focus is on, uh, you know, how far can I take this, whether the player, that whether it be male or female, uh, is really that enthused about what they're doing. There are little too many cases they're doing it for, to satisfy somebody else's ambition rather than their own. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, Rick, because having been involved in coaching school sports, none of which I was very good at coaching, <laughs> I played, um, I, I, for some reason, the enjoyment factor for me was just being able to coach and see the satisfaction the kids got from playing. Um, Outcomes never became a distraction for me as a coach, and I think it helped the way I coached and helped the kids enjoy the experience more. And I'm just not sure if anybody else goes into the games with a mentality of open-mindedness like I had. Uh, and... Uh, the game will take care of itself. The outcome will take care of itself. Your opportunity for achievement is going to be far greater when everybody's enjoying the experience and having fun. And if the outcome factor is uh, distracting that enjoyment factor, then I think that's what the problem is. Everybody's looking for pot of gold at the end of a rainbow as opposed to just appreciating the uh, the rainbow and the experience. So I like the uh, use of the analogy of, you know, it's about the journey. It, it really is because as we're talking here, living our lives and doing those things, trying to make a, people appreciate what sports can do for you, I think that's the reminder that uh, we all have to come back to. Tom, you got your head up? Yeah, I just, going on from what you say, I, it's what the sport teaches. You know, you're, you're committed to something, you show up for practice, you know, uh, you've got friends on the team that you're probably, a lot of them are going to have the rest of your life. You know, uh, you're part of something working for a goal. And I, I know I've got four kids, and I get uh, it. It teaches you how to 
rebound after difficulty and, and not give up. You know, that sometimes things are crappy. Like one of the uh, guys commenting on the game last night, I wrote there about that goal and he said, oh, it took the spirit out of the American team, that goal that would have made a 3-3. I said, bullshit. I mean, Canada was behind do nothing. I mean, you know, a true athlete just keeps on going. I mean, that's a a, a score during the game. It doesn't really mean anything. And, uh, you know, just just fighting and, and getting over roadblocks and all that. Those are those are the things that the game teaches. I mean, it's like one out of a thousand kids ever make the NHL. And it's something like about one out of a few hundred ever get paid for playing the game. And I don't know what it is for college and that. So if that's a goal, that's pretty tough odds to go against. But it's the thing that the game brings. And, uh, you know, that that's what it's got to be all about. And, you know, like you said, the outcomes will take care of themselves. If you have enough talent and if you're working on the right kinds of things, probably you're going to do very well. But if you don't have enough talent, those kids may get a lot better, but, you know, they had too far to go to be one of the top teams. But it's, it's the journey that matters.